that dreadful day no one wants to talk about. There's coming a, a catastrophe that's going to cost the lives of multitudes and change the way we live forever. Something coming soon. And we had better be prepared. And they are warning. See, God takes those without an agenda. He'll take those that are not known. He'll take the poor and the weak of this world. And He'll speak. And He's doing that right now. Many have a right to say, Brother Dave, you have a voice and we don't. But would you please take this message we've heard to the Lord and pray about it. And see if you can speak it to others in a wider audience. And we're hearing that all the time now. Repeatedly. And the newscast, the host of news programs, are, are saying in essence, we can't know it, but intuitively something is telling the whole world that it's on the brink of a catastrophe. On the brink of a catastrophe. These are secular people. This intuitiveness of even the most wicked on the face of the earth, and especially here in the United States, there's intuitive something brewing inside where they know something has happened and they dread to talk about it. There's a fear. Amazing things that are happening now in our time before us. Now, who's listening to all these prophetic warnings, all these warnings coming from secularists and from evangelists and from pastors all over the world and especially the United States. The nation's leaders are not going to hear it. It never does reach them. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all the Old Testament prophets warned of the fall of Babylon. They prophesied about the destruction of the Chaldeans, the Medes, the Persians, Tyre. But those prophets' messages uh, with a few exceptions, never reached them. It's like King Jehudi when Jeremiah sent him a prophecy of coming destruction, took his pen knife and tore it up and threw it in the fire. The haters of Jesus Christ are not going to accept any prophecy that comes from this or any other pulpit on the face of the earth. They mock preachers who give these dire warnings. They say all things continue as they were from the beginning of time. Nothing's going to stop this prosperity. Those who love the world and the things of the world are not going to listen. They're going to turn it off. They don't want anybody to disturb their good times. And I am shocked most of all by preachers and pulpits who despise those who warn of perilous times ahead. Here you have secular uh, scientists and experts warning and pleading. It's not a matter of if, but when. Now, folks, I'm not trying to scare anybody. But in this church, before 9-11 came, the Holy Spirit manifested Himself in ways of quiet warning. Very softly of quiet times that just filled this auditorium, sometimes for 10, 15 minutes at a time and more. There were prophetic words that came forth. And once again, it's happening. When you go to many churches today, this is what you hear. You hear the motivational pep talks. You hear, it, I don't know where this is coming from, but it's a new thing. It's, they say it's all over television now. In, down in Texas, these big uh, mega churches in all the United States. Every sermon now started with a joke. I have people calling and writing to me saying, I can't go anymore because my pastor is just joking. You see, the handwriting is on the wall. You know and I know. Nobody can deny it anymore. Nobody's trying to deny it. We're heading for the falls. We're heading into the, the, the storm of all times. But you don't hear it now. What you hear is God wants you to be rich. He wants you to go first class. Come on, get in on the game. 1,200,000 live on 23 cents a day. 2 billion people have no electricity. 80% of all the people on earth now live in substandard housing. 1 billion people have no safe drinking water. Every 16 seconds, somebody dies of hunger. And then we have those that stand in the pulpit and say, God wants you to be rich. I see on your television here, 
Jesus is all in gilded gold. While the world is starving, Christianity, evangelical Christianity, is depicted as gilded in gold. What does that say in Darfur? What does that say in Africa? What does that say in front of 10 million babies that have been orphaned? What does it say to the billions of people living on 23 cents a day or less? God wants you to be rich. God is speaking, but who's listening? I'm going to tell you, folks, God always has the faithful people who hear. But only those in love with Jesus are going to get it and understand it. God warns of sudden disasters so that they are, we are not swept away by panic as the rest of the world will be. And we will know that this is not a, just a random act of terrorism when it comes. But God knew God allowed God spoke to his body. God spoke to his people. Apostle Peter tells us that the day of the Lord shall come like a thief in the night suddenly he's not speaking right there necessarily only of the coming of the Lord he said there's coming a time when the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat one respected theology a theologian said that sounds like a nuclear holocaust to me but who is Peter addressing here in the text I've just given you he's speaking in the first verse to the beloved beloved now I write unto you to stir up your minds by way of a reminder he said, I'm about to give you a prophecy about a dreaded day coming that nobody's going to want to hear. They're going to say the world continues as it was from the foundation of the earth. They're not going to hear, but he said, I'm giving you a message. Nobody else wants to hear. In essence, that's what he's saying. And he said, but I want this to be on your mind, to be a reminder. And he said, I'm giving it to you for a purpose. Beloved. I write on you to stir up your minds by way of reminder. This is a prophecy that nobody wants to hear. The scoffers will come, he said, scoffing at prophecies of the Old Testament and the New. He, this is what he is about to tell them. This present world, this, the present heavens and earth, in, by the same word, are being reserved for fire kept for the day of judgment, destruction of all of ungodly men. You see, it's the same word that judged the flood, judged Noah's day. And there was a word that came that judged Sodom and Gomorrah. And Peter says, by that same word, by that same God who speaks but a word and is there, it comes. And it will come suddenly. By the same word, He's given us, He's given us something to really think about there's a reserved fire there's a raging fire in reserve God's hand holds it back a reserve in reserve a great dissolving fire for this present day now in my text in the text Peter is referring to the last great judgment when God is going to consume everything and bring forth a new heaven and new earth but this Bible is also full of accounts in the New Testament and in through the prophets about ever increasing calamities before that great fire comes the judgment coming is not going to be by water God said he would never destroy the world again it's not going to be by flood but by fire there's that is being held back now that that all-consuming fire of Almighty God is being held back by the hand of God because God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. It's the patience of God that has held back our judgment. If we got what we truly deserved here in the United States, Israel is just as bad. Other nations, Europe is dead in trespasses and sin. Europe has become an agnostic uh, force all over Europe. Gnosticism absolute incredible spiritual chaos but you see there's much in the Bible that talks about that restraining hand of God 
And when you, if you really know the history of the past 50 to 100 years, you'd be surprised how many times the world was on the verge of absolute chaos and God held it back. And He held it back because He's just waiting for those still to reach because of His utter, utter patience. patience. Folks, aren't you amazed at the patience of Almighty God? Aren't you glad that neither you or me or any of us are on the throne? Because we would have done, we would have released those fires long ago. But they're being held in reserve until His time. Jesus warns men's hearts will fail them for fear over those things that are coming on the earth. It would be a time of great distress. Israel now is being abandoned. This breaks the heart of any true Christian. It should. In evangelical Christianity now, there are more and more even evangelicals turning against Israel. It looks like only the United States and one or two other countries still are, uh, have a heart for Israel. And they're standing very lonely, surrounded by those who are swearing to wipe them off the map. Living in Israel now is really a difficult time. Our forefathers, there were no... Hitler didn't have atomic bombs. He didn't have nuclear weapons that could wipe cities and nations off the map. This is another day. Now, I'm not going to leave you in this uh, dark room. If something rises up in us and says, this is too much to hear. There's such bad news today and so much stress and so many tragedies. And we cringe. I cringe. And they say, well, why remind us? Why don't you just let it happen? Peter gives us a reason this message has to be heard. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. In other words, you are getting the understanding. This has to be preached. I'm giving you an understanding and knowledge. What kind of persons ought you to be now in all holy conduct and godliness? He said, the Spirit will warn us. He, he will talk to us so that He can wake up a sleeping church, so that He can wake up the sleeping virgins, that He can get His church away from lukewarmness. Go hot, go cold, but He said, I'm going to take out all middle ground. I'm, I'm taking out every excuse because this is the time for conforming. You're going to conform to Christ. Peter says, and Paul says the same thing. He said, seeing these things are going to happen, being reminded of it. He said, put this in your mind. And that's not the message. The message is about being conformed to the image of Christ. The message here, he said, seeing all these things, what kind of persons? You should measure your heart and, and what kind of person are you becoming in light of these things? If you take it lightly, now, we're not to panic. In fact, he said, we, we are to enter these times with peace of heart, the very peace of Christ that passes all understanding. But what kind of persons ought you to be? Be diligent that you'll be found in Him in peace without spot and blameless. Paul and Peter ministered in times just like these. Even Christ walked about the streets of Jerusalem, warning of a holocaust. He said, the temple's coming down, not one stone will be upon another. He wept over the city and he grieved over it. And he said, your day of visitation came. He, he, he warned and warned of what is coming. And it would be only 70 years later when Cyrus comes in and over a million people die in Jerusalem and the whole city is brought to ruin. So what kind of message do you preach in times like these? Now in Paul's time, there was a lot of Jesus bashing more probably than we see today. There was a doctrine of devils sweeping through the church. False prophets in Pentecostal churches. Ungodly preachers came pretending to be angels of light. There was rampant homosexuality and sensuality all through the Roman Empire. There was pride, focus on self, flesh worship. Paul said of the times, these are those who suppress God's word. They fornicate. They're given over to reprobate minds, envious, greedy, full of strife and covetousness, gossipers, insolent, arrogant, inventors of evil things, unloving, unmerciful. The temple had become a den of thieves. 
It sounds like he's talking about our times, these present times. And all through that, Jesus is walking the streets warning, judgment is at the door. What's the message of the apostles on the brink of this dreadful day when Jerusalem will be brought to ruins? Peter said, knowing this beforehand, knowing these things beforehand, knowing these things beforehand, be on your guard lest you get carried away by the error of the wicked and you fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul stood up in these times knowing, seeing what was coming. And he cries out, and this is the message, Walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, it's not going to be long till Jerusalem is in ruins. But see, they've given the warning and now they pass on. My prayer for you is that you pursue intimacy, that you grow in spiritual understanding, and that you walk worthy of the Lord. Habakkuk, the third chapter of Habakkuk, he, he has shown dreadful times that were coming to Israel. He was so shocked. He was in the tower looking out. And he was so shocked. And he says, oh God, what, what can you say to the church? What, what do you say to my heart in this time of reproof and judgment? And remember what God said? The just shall live by faith. That was the message. Folks, we're coming to a time we're going to survive by faith. We're going to be able to defeat the devil only by faith. And that's not faith. Choose and pick faith for one crisis and another. But in all things, in looking at the future, in looking at what is coming, I don't care how dreadful it sounds. I don't care how gloomy it may sound. The word is, these things should not move you. They should motivate you into this walk. Oh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. God, help us if we ever lose that kind of godly fear. We believe what God says in His Word. But He said you're going to live by faith. There's not going to be any middle ground. And I, I, I plead with those of you that are here. You see, we are to be conformed now. This is the time. You can be going the wrong way at judgment. Which way are you headed? That's the question. Are you willing now to look at this in light of the world and situation and all that's coming? It, it could happen tonight. And I honestly believe, and this has been deep, deep in my soul, that something could happen very soon that tests the faith of every Christian, even the elect will try your faith. Something could happen, and I feel it in my spiritual bones, that could shake all of our prophetic theologies. Could shake. Jesus said, when I come, will I find faith? That, that, that's more than just coming at salvation, coming at various times. He's really saying, when I return, am I going to find faith? faith what he's talking about is this faith in all things faith for everything having not even one area in your life that you would disbelieve because you see you can't conform the image of Christ except by faith you can't do it by saying I want to live that kind of life I, I, here's, here's the standard put on therefore as the chosen of God holy and beloved a heart of compassion kindness humility gentleness patience bearing with one another folks these things fly against everything that's being taught in our country and the world today forgiving one another whoever has a complaint against them. you have a complaint against somebody if you stood against leadership just as the Lord forgave you so should you also forgive in light of what's coming, Paul said, are you becoming more like Christ? Are you patient now or more quick-tempered? Are you tender or are you going hard? I'm going to...
We're going to wrap this up. But Paul, I believe, is saying, and, and Brother Peter also, he's saying, these things are brought to your attention. Put it in a reminder. Just remind them. Remind yourself every day when you get up, I'm not living for this world. These things are all going to pass away. Everything's going to be dissolved. And one of these days, very soon, you and I are not going to be worrying about it anymore. We're going to be walking the streets of the New Jerusalem. Now, you see, to the unbeliever, this looks like a very bad deal. A sinner sitting here today would say, Now, wait a minute. Many afflictions for the righteous, you say? Dying to self every day? Enduring a lifetime of difficulties? And trials, turning the cheek to those who hurt you, giving to other people when you're in need yourself. And then you suffer like sinners do. You too get cancer, you get diabetes, heart attacks, accidents, blindness and trials. On top of that, your preachers warn you that there's judgment coming. Well, folks, they don't know the rest of the story. They don't know the loving kindness of our Christ. They have never experienced the assurance and the blessedness of the Holy Spirit as He comes to minister in these times of affliction and times of testing and trial. And God is purifying His church. Folks, He's going to blow His wind through the church. He's going to blow all of this filth out. This will not be standing when the fires come. Or if they are, the fires will consume them and they'll go up in smoke overnight. I'm closing with this thought in the book called The Clash of Civilizations the writer says that Christianity is going to be overtaken by Muslims the day of Christianity is finished CNN just recently said Muslim Islamic religion is now the world's fastest growing religion and in the clash of the civilizations, the totaled everything up, and in the end, he said, Muhammad wins. Well, folks, I've got news. There is no game. The battle's over. It's already been won at Calvary. It was won at the resurrection. There's no competition, period. It's finished. It's all done. Jesus won, and then he rose from the dead. We don't say Jesus is going to win. We say He already won. He said the day of the Lord is hastening toward us. <laughs> there should be a joy. If you're secure in Christ, you ought to be able to raise your hands. Just thank God that Christ has won the victory for you in your heart and in your family. We are not defeated. We don't go down in defeat and despair. Lord, thank you for the resurrection. No other man. Lord, one day soon, every false prophet is going to come and kneel before our Christ. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Every knee of every prophet of all false religion shall bow at the name and the mention of your name shall bow before your throne on that day. Oh, blessed be the name of our God eternal. Blessed be the Christ of Calvary. Lord, we know in whom we have believed and we will not be shaken in these last days.